The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. My baby dolls, we're back again. Another episode of Genesis. As always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz. And we have a recurring author coming back to the uh, show. And uh, Jeff Katz, who wrote one of my favorite books of 2015, Split Season 1981, um, is coming back. We're going to talk about the split season of 1981. We're going to be discussing some of my favorite topics here. We're going to be discussing Marvin Miller, Pete Rose, Dave Winfield, the Players Union. Um, it's going to be a fantastic show. And uh, we had uh, Jeff on back two years ago, and I didn't know much as much as I know now as Marvin of uh, Marvin Miller. And looking into a little bit more of split season, I see that. Um, Mr. Katz over here was able to speak to both <laughs> Marvin Miller and uh, Mel Graby, who was the lead negotiator for the um, owners. So we're going to have a great show. Um, we'll get to Jeff in the book in about, oh, two minutes. But you are listening uh, to the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. Network's growing. Like I always say, we have Bill Cachetis doing the Philadelphia baseball thing. We got Nancy Finley doing the Oakland A's baseball thing. We got Peter Golenbach in Golenbach University. Hal Box doing vintage sports. We got Mark Littell and Mark Weiss doing Mark and Mark in the midday. And of course, if you don't know who Mark Littell is or was, he was the guy that gave up the home run to Chris Chambliss in the 1976. American League Championship Series that sent the Yankees into the World Series for the first time in 12 years. And so the network is growing. Basically what we do here is to educate and to enlighten folks. What I like to do is take stuff from the past and, of course, the time machine with me went all the way back to the early 1800s. We've had Professor Deborah Shattuck on the show doing the Bloomer Girls. We found out that, you know, baseball was created for unisex uh, folks to play, and, of course, women as well as blacks, Latinos, minorities. Uh, by the late 1880s, it started to being pushed out of the game. We've had shows. Uh, yesterday I had a show with Marjorie Adams, who is the great-granddaughter of uh, Doc Adams, who really pioneered baseball and should be considered the father of uh, baseball. And two years ago, he almost made the uh, Hall of Fame, uh, lost it by two two votes. And you know, I mean, a um, lot of lot of lot of stuff, a lot of baseball learning I did. But uh, you know, Jeff, hey, he's the mayor of Cooperstown, and uh, so he's right there. And you know, he's written this wonderful book. He's also written a book about how Kansas City was the uh, pretty much the farm team of uh, the New York Yankees back in the 50s before Charlie O and uh, Carl Finley took it over. But, hey, without any further ado, welcome to the show, Jeff. Sounds like you're struggling on the other line. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Good to be you back. Know, I'm like, oh, what's all that noise? I'm like, guys, is he in a fist fight or something? You know, it doesn't surprise me. Anyone <laughs> anyone who comes on to my show. I mean, I had Brett Boone a few weeks ago, and, you know, it's funny. We're going to talk about his father, dad, his father uh, Bob Boone. I spoke to uh, Booney yesterday, and I, uh, I'm, I'm honored and I'm blessed to, have spe to speak to a lot of these former players. And his dad was sitting right next to him. I'm like, oh, my God, can I speak to your dad for a sec? I said, I remember you. <laughs> I remember you as a kid. Oh, my God. And I said, I got you. Jeff Katz on my show, and, and and how you were instrumental and with the players. Oh my God! And, and uh, he was, he was like, yeah, yeah. We, it's like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> oh, you know, John, I, I I tell you, for um, you know, for seven years, I um, I was pretty much crippled when you last spoke to me. And uh, most of my listeners know that, um, you know, uh, I was vice president of Citizens Bank, the youngest one at 39. And by 41, my diabetes started to get to me. And Wow. I, yeah, I have my master's in history, my master's in tax, and my master's in accounting. And, of course, I'm a lawyer as well. I made a career of going to school, and I climbed the corporate ladder, and so I was struck down. So around the time of 2014, I created all my sites, which you're a part of some of them, and right. people came. People noticed that I educate. We had, hmm. I was very fortunate to have you on the show two years ago uh, to begin the inquiry of the uh, 1981 season. Why is this season so magical yet so overlooked? I mean, it's a pivotal season in Major League Baseball history. 
Yeah, you know, I think there's two parts uh, of 1981 that are gripping for me. One is certainly uh, what happened on the field. And if you watched the beginning of last night's World Series game, uh, to have Fernando come back out to throw the first pitch shows to this day how important he was that year uh, and still is. The other thing that, as you say, is a bit overlooked is the strike. The strike in 81 was the first midseason strike in sports history. Um, what's interesting about it in ways that other strikes are less interesting is the season started, it stopped, and it was resumed. And, and most strikes delay seasons, end seasons early, things like that. Uh, certainly the 1994 strike when uh, Seelig and the owners canceled the World Series um, – overshadows every work stoppage in all sports history. Uh, but the 81 strike to me is a watershed moment where the players, uh, you know, who I think often are painted unfairly as superficial and greedy, uh, fought for a principle they really believed in, which was free agency and the ability to move for your job in a way that every American takes for granted. Uh, and they stuck to their guns, and they suffered mightily, and they prevailed. And I think for sure, you know, one of the parts of the subtitle is the strike that saved baseball. Um, keeping free agency intact led to a remarkable period over the next 10 or so years where so many different teams made the playoffs, made the World Series. Free agency allowed bad teams to get good quickly. Uh, and the players get credit for sticking to their guns and fighting to keep it. And, you know, you do mention in every interview I've ever seen or heard with you in it, and especially with my last podcast, you really do believe this is the most important strike. Now, again, we go back to 72, we go back to 73, we go back to, um, you know, the sites of decision with free agency. What was going on in 1980 that was brewing uh, in the back rooms of baseball and in Marvin Miller's office? So, uh, as you said, Peter Seitz was the independent arbitrator that was chosen by both the players and the owners. And in December of 75, he, his ruling was the pivotal vote. It was a three-person board. And his ruling said that the players were not held to the reserve clause. They basically couldn't be tied to one team forever on this reoccurring renewal of a one-year option in perpetuity. So what had to happen going into 76 was players in the last year of their contract had to not sign a new contract, basically play the full year without a contract, and then they'd be free agents. Um, what was interesting, you bring up Nancy Finley, uh, Charlie Finley, as owner of the A's, said uh, to the other owners, let them all become free agents glut the market with players and prices will stay the same or, or salaries will stay the same or come down. Um, he was right, but owners hated Charlie Finley, so they never listened to him. Um, what ended up happening was the Players Association and the owners agreed to <laughs> a player's plan, which basically put out on the market players in their prime. So owners signed on to a deal that allowed – the best players in the game to enter free agency when they were about 27, 28. Still, no one knew how much money was going to be thrown at players till it happened. There was a little bit of a preview in December of 74 when Steinbrenner threw a million bucks or so to Catfish Hunter, and even Hunter was shocked. So what happened between the first year of free agent signings, which was end of 76, beginning of 77, until 1980, was owners couldn't control themselves. And like you would do, like I would do, if someone comes to you and says, hey, you are making 50 grand a year, I'm going to offer you 500 grand a year, it's not really up to you to say, you know, I'm not really worth that. And, you know, think, think of your own bottom line. I, I sh you shouldn't give me that money. So players were getting bigger salaries that were given to them by owners. And by 1980, the owners wanted to, in effect, kill free agency to control their own spending. Uh, there was almost a strike in 1980. Miller and Greeby, the owner's negotiator, came to a last-minute uh, settlement, which uh, 
resolved every problem except for the free agency problem, which was the big one. And basically over the next six months, ten months, they were supposed to negotiate, negotiate what, if any, compensation should be given to teams that lost free agency. And I'll, I'll pause here because I could go on for another ten minutes about that, but I want to give you a chance to follow up. Oh, no, you know, uh, you did this just so much, you know. But let me ask you something. Again, Marvin Miller was from the steel industry. Didn't, Gre- didn't Greeby come also from the steel industry? Greeby was a GE negotiator for General Electric. General Electric was well known as kind of a union, if not union busting, uh, union uh <laughs> destructive organization. So the owners brought Greeby in uh, in 78, I think, uh, as a way to bring in a non-baseball negotiating professional. And, you know, it wasn't a bad move if they had let him behave more like um, he was able to behave in corporate America. But baseball then, and I would probably say baseball now, you know, is run by 30 people with different agendas, and uh, they kind of undermined his efforts, although Greedy brought his own kind of bag of difficulties with him. Uh, he and Miller were antagonistic almost from day one. And, you know, in the book you mentioned, it really got nasty. This was probably the most nastiest strike. But let me ask you this about Greeby. He's an, he's an experienced negotiator, and you had the good fortune, in, in continuing to read, uh, of speaking to both Greeby and Miller before they died. They died a year apart. Uh, Miller died, I think, in uh, 2012, Greeby in 13. Miller was like 95. Greeby was 85. But you also were, had the good fortune of being on an email where Greeby actually supports Marvin Miller being in the Hall of Fame as well. Yeah, the Greedy story for me is interesting. Um, I had started working on a general proposal for for what would become split season back in 08, 09, which was fortunate because, as you mentioned, Greedy and Miller were still alive. Through um, through some personal connections, I talked to Clark Griffith, who was the son of former Twins owner Calvin Griffith, grandson of Hall of Famer Clark Griffith, and Clark and I was on Clark was on the player relations committee, which was kind of the ownership subcommittee that would deal with negotiations. And Clark had heard I was working on something uh about nineteen eighty one and he suggested I call Greeby. Uh so I called Greeby and he said, You know, I talked to my son about speaking to you. And he said, I should. I should get my story out there. I haven't talked about baseball in a long time, which seemed to be true. But, Greeby said, I want to do this in person. So he lived in Stamford, Connecticut. I drove from Cooperstown to Connecticut, spent the whole day with him. Um, And on one hand, you know, he, he was an older guy. He had lost an eye to cancer. You know, you have a kind of innate sympathy for that situation and and he was very nice we went out for lunch he gave me a cigar to smoke on the way home um but as we talked you could see the things that miller and the players really disliked about him you know condescension a little bit of racism a little you know uh i i left there feeling that you know he was as difficult a persona in his prime uh, as, as I had read about. And when I started doing research on Split Season a few years later, reading some of the notes that Harry Dalton, who was general manager of the Brewers, took, um, really showed how difficult Greeby was um, in terms of what he would say publicly and what he would say privately. So, uh, I was I was thrilled to be able to talk to him and getting to your point about the letter. Um, after we spoke, I, I think people tend to blur some lines when they find out I'm the mayor of Cooperstown, or at the time I wasn't the mayor, I was a, a elected member of the Board of Trustees. They kind of think that there's some connect, like as mayor of Cooperstown, I have no say over the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, but Greeby sent an email to me advocating 
Miller to be a Hall of Famer, which I directed to the Hall, but I had an original. <laughs> uh, and his point was basically, you know, let bygones be bygones. Put Miller in. He did more for the game than anyone. And to Greeby's credit, he said, no one suffered <laughs> more than I did dealing with Miller. Because Miller could be a pretty sharp, biting uh, critic. Uh, so I thought, you know, late in life, it was pretty pretty big of, of Greeby to write something like that. And, and, you know, you also talked to Marvin Miller about this. Uh, and let me ask you this, because two things I got out of uh, reading the book. You know, first of all, Greeby lied. He said, yeah, the players are in conjunction. We're going to work this. The players weren't. And he lied. He said, we're in conjunction to go through a process. Miller blew a gasket over that. But Greeby, also what people don't know, he was pretty much canned by baseball a year after. And they labeled him the man who do, who destroyed baseball, I think, or uh, something he was named like that. Um, how did Miller deal with this? Because now he's probably dealing with the most toughest negotiator he ever had to deal with with the magnets over here. So what's interesting about Miller to me is, you know, I, I'm not a big expert on labor history. But, you know, it is – there's a historic – thread where, you know, labor leaders are perceived by ownership as outside agitators, uh, kind of Svengalis who rule their workers, uh, who in in another situation would just be um, happy to deal with the owners. And that's just false. If you look at union management history, the idea that <laughs> ownership takes care of their workers be, out of kindness is just false. Owners take care of their workers when workers organize and, and you know, pitch their, their needs. So Miller, um, you know, as far as ownership was concerned, was this outside commie who, <laughs> who stirred a pot of happy workers on the plantation, to use that reference. But what Miller did was different. Miller came in to a situation in, in the mid 60s of players who you perceive as very strong, powerful people who were really kind of meek, powerless people in their business. And basically what Miller said to them was, here's your situation. Here are your rights. And here are some things that can be done. But he always listened to the players. You know, there's a, the perception is he led the players, like, by the nose. The reality from all the research and the people I've talked to is he was a great listener. And as a result of that, the players and the union, or the union as the voice of the players, was always a cohesive group. And um, when Miller would go up against Greeby, who – you know, how to say certain things at the table, how to say certain things to certain groups of owners, how to say certain things to different owners. Um, Miller was always straight on point. And Murray Chatch, who was then with the New York Times and was uh, – he, he's become a, a prickly personality <laughs> as he's gotten older, but back then he was really one of the great writers of baseball business. Uh, what he had said was Miller – and the union never lied to me. The owners always did. So, <laughs> um, so Miller just always kind of stuck to his path. You know, the players had gotten free agency by a process dictated by collective bargaining. Then they collectively bargained it into the agreement, and he was going to stick to it and move forward for workers' rights. And he always kind of stood for that in a way that I think has gotten blurred over time. So he dealt with it like he would deal with any ownership voice. And even the way he started out, he actually made a trip in spring training to every major league baseball team so they can vote him in as the uh, chief executive of the uh, National League, uh, the, the uh, Players Union Board. And, you know, he, st he didn't start his assault on the uh, reserve clause immediately. First, he had to go get him the pension fund, and then he had to go get him certain rights to access for uh, the media. Because 
let's face it, the owners were just making tons of money off their name. And little by little, he was chipping away, and then the whole Kurt Flood thing, and then the whole April um, lockout for 13 days. But here, he was a little bit smarter. And two things I want to mention here. One is, you mentioned the Yankees. And you mentioned it in your book, hey, there's no free agency. The Yankees got all the best players. They're winning seven, eight World Series, five in a row. But this is what I want to say. George Weiss is the poster child for what the reserve clause stood for. Yogi Berra wins three MVPs. Okay, the year he doesn't win an MVP, he still bats over 300, has over 25 home runs. And, you know, he has to go there begging the Weiss for a raise. And he's like, well, he didn't win the MVP, I'll give you a two. <laughs> but this is what, this is, uh, the plays, you know, and, and it, it, today it's just ludicrous. Today Barrow would say, go screw yourself, I'm opting out of my contract, and I'm going to another team that's going to pay me. But that's what you had uh, back then. And that's what um, the owners did now. The owners don't seem too bright here. And Bowie Kuhn comes off like a meathead through the whole thing when he really was a talented lawyer before he became commissioner of baseball. This time it was a little different with the Magnets. How do you think they handled this whole thing uh, during the strike? And, by the way, um, it was done mid-season, as you well point out, because the players are going to get paid half a season, not like before. And then the strike will come and, you know, people will get pissed off that baseball isn't uh, going on. But how did the owners do something different this time than they did last time? Well, I think what happened, uh, another thing that I see as kind of a watershed moment for 81 is besides kind of a struggle over over salaries and compensation and free agency, there's also – just a general power struggle that I wouldn't say has its last gasp in 81, but almost. So in 81, you still had some family ownership of baseball. You know, uh, Gussie Bush in St. Louis is probably the best example. An old industry leader who's owned the team and sees the players as his property and how dare they who are they to not just ask for things or demand things but who are they to even inquire about how we do our business and come to the table as equals and say I'd like to see your books if you're saying you're going out of business then we'd like to see your books how dare you say this to me so the owners then as opposed to the owners now were there was a parochialism to it. There was a paternalistic sense that these players were dumb jocks who are my things, and they have no say in this business. It's different now. Uh, one, I think it's different because of how big the money is. Um, you know, when A-Rod signed for $20 million, everyone was shocked, and now Ricky Porcello signed for $20 million, and everyone's like, all right, I can see that. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a different world now, and I think both sides accept that this is business and not personal. And, you know, you even go back to 81, you talked about Kuhn. Um, I, I think it's – I forget exactly how Miller said it, but he said, you know, people think because he went to Princeton he's a smart guy. He's not a smart guy. And I've read through a lot of his papers, and I've talked to a lot of people outside of the research for split season, people who knew him. Louis Kuhn was not a smart guy. Um but you were still living in an era where a commissioner like Kuhn could say publicly and mean it that he felt he was an impartial commissioner of both the players and owners equally, even though the owners hired him, even though the owners pay him, even though the owners could fire him, which they did. Rob Manfred does not pretend <laughs> that he is the commissioner of the owners and the players in a blind judicial way. He represents the ownership. In a, in a conceptual way, he represents the game, but he doesn't represent union interests. So, you know, a lot of that in 81 was, it was more than just the dollars and cents, although that was part of it. It was also who is the game, who speaks for the game. 
Uh, and that's a, a fascinating fight, right? You know, are the wor- you know, Re- Reggie Jackson at a negotiating session said to the owners, "Look, people don't pay to see you; <laughs> they pay to see us." Uh, and that's true. I mean, watching the game last night, did anyone think about, you know, thank God for Astros ownership. That made the you know, Astros ownership made the game so exciting last night. No one's takeaway from watching the games is who owns the teams. So, you know, there, there was a lot of, of, you know, dissension about who could properly voice their opinion on the game. And and that's really, even though it was only 36 years ago, that's like 150 years ago in terms of how labor relations work. No, yeah. And, you know, one thing about Kuhn, I'm going to put an asterisk here. We know that he had problems. He didn't attend uh, the thing with Hank Aaron when he hit his home run. Uh, You know, he was accused there. We know the whole thing with Charlie Finley and how he overturned the uh, trades because he saw that these guys are going to be lost to, to uh, free agency. We saw that he supported, um, you know, uh, the whole ownership turned the whole flood versus Kuhn. But what people don't understand was that when he left baseball, um, he uh, opened up a law firm, and that law firm went bankrupt. And he was accused of doing not good dealings, and his assets had to be shielded because they were coming after him, Kuhn. He didn't make good decisions. But even though he's from Princeton, I think he looked, his emotions get the best of him, and I think this was pretty much clear in 1981. He, he let his emotions get clear, and he, and he let Greeby do the uh, negotiations. I, I think he was – so just, you know, yeah, after baseball, he was part of this law firm that was – I think criminally fraudulent, and he kind of ran to Florida where his personal assets would be shielded. And I know people who knew him in New Jersey who who were actually involved and kind of like knew about his house sale, and he had to kind of get out of Dodge quick. I don't know if it was emotion. It was this fantasy belief in baseball. That was kind of of its time, but on its way out. So Kuhn grew up as a big Senators fan. He was a a league attorney before he became commissioner. You know, in Cooperstown, you know, he loved the Hall of Fame. I mean, really, truly. Um, You know, Kuhn bought into this romanticism of baseball, which we all do in our own way. Um, But in his mind, he was he was Judge Landis, right? He was the all-powerful, all-ruling commissioner who cared about the game, and anything that he said was by default the best for the game, right? Mm-hmm. The, the best interest of baseball clause. Um, so he saw no inconsistencies. I wanted to touch on what you said about Finley. So when Finley traded Rudy and Fingers and who else? Uh, Joe Rudy, Fingers, Vita Blue. Okay, he traded those three guys in 76 because he wanted to get something for these players who were all going to become free agents. And Kuhn voided those trades, saying they weren't in the best interest of baseball. Finley sued Kuhn in baseball, saying, how could you do this to me? And what Kuhn said under oath was, Finley has gotten his value from the, these players. He's had them for years as minor leaguers, as major leaguers. He's already extracted his value and doesn't need to trade them, which was exactly what the player's case was in protecting trade. He's saying, but he saw no inconsistency in that because whatever he believed was in the best interest of baseball. So, you know, it's just kind of this blind sense of, status and power as commissioner, but he really was weak. And, you know, one of the things that Greeby would complain about, you know, to me, uh, and not just to me, but there are other stories about it, was instead of what would happen at a corporation like GE, <clears throat> management would make its position known and Greeby would try to get that done. Greeby had to listen to Kuhn, he had to listen to the hawkish owners, the 
moderate owners, the uh, owners who wanted to settle. Uh, Kuhn had his own people he preferred, right? So he would never listen to Charlie Finley, but he would also always listen to Walter O'Malley, right? So Kuhn was trying to protect his own power base. Um, so for a, for an owner's negotiator, Greeby was kind of left hanging. Uh, did he know how true labor negotiations worked? Sure. Was he able to work that way for baseball commissioner and ownership? No. Uh, and they and they kind of undermined him as he as he tried to negotiate what he perceived as their interests. But you know that's not to defend Greeby. He had his own issues as well. What bothered me about Greeby in reading your book was you have Bob Boone at the table there, Doug Dixon saying the players are talking to Greeby, and he just totally over overlooks them. He's not even looking. He just goes right to Marvin Miller like they don't even exist. Yeah, I mean, the perception of the players was that Greeby <clears throat> wanted nothing to do with them. <laughs> and, and this is in Greeby's defense, you know, um, you know, when he was a GE, you'd have the management side and the owner and the labor side. What happened with the the baseball negotiations was there was this kind of revolving door. Yes, there were the consistent people at the table: Miller, Don Fear, Desense, Belanger, Steve Rogers, and Bob Boone. But but the union said to the players, the player reps, "Hey, you want to come and listen? You're part of the union. Come on in." And it drove Greeby crazy because guys would just pop in, uh, and he didn't respect them. He didn't think they were smart. The reality is they were they were pretty sharp guys. You know, certainly the guys at the table uh, consistently w- were sharp. Um, but Greeby didn't like, you know, did he not like the players as, you know, rank-and-file workers per se? Maybe. I think he just didn't like that there was this constant – back and forth of different people at the table, you know. So Rusty Staub would be there, and Staub hated Greeby. <laughs> I was talking to Staub about Greeby a couple of years ago, and Staub got so angry. I was sorry I even brought it up. Like, it was 30-plus years later. But, you know, John Matlack was at the table. You know, different guys. Reggie would show up. If you were in town, if you were in New York or Washington, you could show up. Um, but it certainly made the players angry to be treated so badly. And there's a great Seaver quote, and I know I have it in the book, uh, when it comes to the owners thinking the players would cave quickly. Seaver, who's really kind of my all-time favorite, smart, you know, besides what he did on the field, just a sharp guy. Uh, Seaver said, you know, I don't know, I don't understand how they can feel that. We are competitive people trained to be competitive and be part of a team. Why would we be the ones to fold. And he was so right. The players are team players. The owners are individuals. It's, it's a, it's a, it's char, those are characteristics that are bound to make the players succeed always. And I'll tell you, you know, it's, it's eerie that you mentioned that because I was just going to read the quote from your book. And I'll read it. <laughs> and I'll, ask, I'll ask you the question I was asked to you in another interview okay. because I was coming in. They, and, and Seaver and I quote from your book, the owners are taking a very destructive position. It's very disturbing. If they are trying to alienate the players, they are doing a good job. But they are working with competitive individuals. Owners from their lofty positions always knew that players would never pass up a paycheck, regardless of how much they were making. They'd be proved wrong before and since. Now, they still underestimated the players that after all these years, you know, they're not going to stick together when they stuck together throughout the 70s. Why did they think that way? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's just a nature of ownership <clears throat> that makes one believe that. You know, and the proof of that to me is mm. from 81 to 94. So in 81, uh, Jerry Reinsdorf and Eddie Einhorn had just bought the White Sox before the 81 season. I, I had talked to Jerry, and, you know, he, he was an interesting character to talk to. Um, and I think, truthfully, as a new owner in 81, he didn't buy into any of this kind of old ownership stuff. Like, one of the things he said to me was, when the players said, if you're crying poverty, let's see your books, 
he was like, sure, why not? There's not that much money in the game. I mean, he was talking about the White Sox TV contract under Bill Veck and then under Reinsdorf and Einhorn. You know, it was it was piddling compared to what it is today. By 1994, Jerry Reinsdorf was the hawkish of the hawks. <laughs> And, you know, here's a guy who had been through the 81 strike as a new owner, saw the pitfalls of an old ownership mentality, and by 1994, he, Steelig, they're the biggest hawks in the world, and they provoke another strike, believing the same things that were proved wrong in 85, there was a one-day strike, in 81, in 80 when there was almost a strike, in 72, and well, Reinsdorf wasn't there in 72. But guys making the same mistakes over and over again in terms of how the players behave. And, you know, I know this is uh, off the topic, but I mentioned it towards the end of the book. The only thing that has ripped the players apart as a cohesive unit has been PEDs and steroids. It's the one thing that provided cracks in that unified um dance on everything so um i don't know what it is about ownership i mean (laughs) when you're an owner you're an owner and you feel that whatever you decide is right so over time if you become you know more hardened about positions then you know that's right and you're blind to kind of the evidence in front of you It's, it's it's a fascinating kind of mindset and, and, you know, I, like I said, I was in corporate America for about 20 years, and pretty much, you know, my career ended in my early 40s. But I could tell you, being on a management team, being a vice president, um, the owners are so blind, uh, just like Creevy was here, just totally ignored the workers and their cries, and they think they – they got it so wrapped up, and we're going to do this, and we're going to go that, and we're going to do that. The, the narcissism I've seen, that even when I told them tax-wise, you're going to be taxed a lot of money. And, and this, and mm-hmm. you know, this, this, this also took place during the whole Citizens Bank Park being built in Philadelphia. Because I was right. the committee. You know, and, and I had a fight saying, look, we cannot group Citizens Bank of uh, Pennsylvania in uh, with the uh, – the uh, New England um, states because they have different laws that are going yeah right right and huh. they didn't even want to listen they just thought you know just, but still in the U.S. I said no and, and until you show them the numbers and until yeah. you show them the lawsuits they don't want they're so blind by their own narcissism I think the right. owners were to say wait but the difference is and I could talk about it now where I couldn't t- uh, talk to you about it two years ago was the fact that. For Bowie Kuhn, this hurt him. And in a few years, um, you know, he would be um, taken out. Uh, we did put on Peter Uberoff. But with, you know, uh, with what's his name, uh, Bud Selig, he got right. stronger out of the strike. You know, he got, he got, for another 20 years, he'd be there. He'd screw around with the umpires in 1999 when they went up on strike. Right. They called their, you know, they called their bluff. He said, "Okay, right. you guys, you guys want to walk out? I'll tell you what. If you don't have your, um, you know, your memo on my desk by Tuesday, begging me to come back, to, you're all going to be fired, and I'm going to use the minor league umpires." Right, and right. They did. Well, they did. And, and you, you know, know, the thing about Seal to me is, you know, <laughs> so what I found fascinating it was endlessly fascinating this past summer to to hear Sealig's speech an induction to hear him at other conferences as if the way he would present things would be, you know, the strike of 94, it happened. I was so upset by it as if he wasn't an active force in making it happen. (laughs) And people giving him credit saying, well, you know, there's been 20 years of labor peace. Yeah, there's been 20 years of labor peace because Seelig's desire to to kind of crush the union, put in salary caps, it failed so miserably and to the <laughs> to the harm of the game that yes, he he backed off. Is that a sign of growth? Sure. Um, <laughs> 
you know, if you murder someone and you go to jail and you come out and you don't murder someone again, I guess that's good. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I guess you get credit for not killing another person, but it doesn't absolve your blame uh, and guilt in the first part. So, you know, what what made Selig strong, you know, there's a couple of good things that come out of Selig, right? When Selig becomes commissioner, no one can pretend that the commissioners represent the players. Here was an owner raised to be commissioner. <laughs> you know, he's not on both sides of the issue. Um, but it also, by kind of getting away from a lot of old tribalism, the league, you know, one league versus the other, you know, things like that, it became from an administrative point of view much more businesslike. So why do people, why do ownership, why does ownership love Selig? The explosion in revenue for Major League Baseball has been extraordinary. And that all comes under Selig. Uh, is it all his ideas? Doesn't matter. He, he represented it. The, the baseball alternative media, MLB Network, MLB.com, World Baseball, Selig's tenure saw, saw an explosion in baseball revenue that actually the players share less in baseball revenue now than they did 30 years ago. Um, but um, wouldn't you love a guy who did that to you too? Uh, you know, when, when the Ricketts family bought the Cubs, whenever it was, five years ago, six years ago, I think they put in, I think they paid $700 million. I'm just trying to remember it. Probably a couple hundred million was in cash. That team's worth two billion now, on its way to three, maybe three billion. Yeah, thank I would thank Bud Selig as well. So you know, um, I think we're at a point where where it's you know, business is business, and as you say, Selig got stronger over time, but he got stronger because he lined his colleagues' pockets, and that's fine. You know, I. I mean, there's, I have no problem with that. Well, that's the thing, the bottom line. Now, here, when we go back to 1981, you, know, you got Reisendorf showing the books, and everyone knows George is buying up championships and all that in New York. But they're all crying poverty. But there was a fund, a secret fund stored somewhere where Miller knew, where, you know, about it, and they weren't letting any uh, publicity about that. What's going on with that? Well, well, people did not, if you're talking about the insurance, um, yeah. the, the owners had taken out insurance after 1980. But I think it was like a $50 million strike insurance, which was a crazy policy. They got it from Lloyd's of London, which is is or was, I don't know if it exists anymore, um, was not a kind of standard insurance type company. They They did weird things. So basically, you know, they gave the owners strike insurance without even understanding that the owners – could cause a strike. The way, the way the 1980 agreement came out was basically the owners could implement a compensation scheme for free agency, but if they did, the players had the right to strike. So Lloyds of London gives the owners an insurance policy, not really understanding that the owners could make that pay. Um, the players couldn't get an insurance uh, policy. It just didn't work that way. So the, the owners had some cushion in the instance of a strike, um, and that really kind of guided a lot of what happened. They needed, the, if there was going to be a strike, it had to be done in 1981 because that's when the insurance would happen, uh, and the strike really came to a close as the insurance money started ending. So um, all, all those things are, are woven together. Definitely a smart move by the owners to have that kind of uh, – money to, to cushion any other losses in terms of uh, ticket sales and things like that. But it certainly hardened them for a strike in 1981. One of the research things I, I got to use was the Hall of Fame has Bowie Kuhn's papers. And it's not so much the papers that were great, but the um, his little doodles and, and notes to himself. And one of the notes to himself was uh, he wrote, like, this is the one-bite theory. Like, we have to have them strike in 81 because 
we've got this money on the side to help us kind of crush them. Uh, it didn't work, though. Yeah, I mean, that's that's unbelievable. Now, let me ask you this, because media was very important to Marvin Miller. And, you know, go back 15 years, well, actually go back about 11 years uh, from 1981, and, of course, I was born in the 70s, so I don't remember this, but I've read a lot about it. You know, the, the public wasn't behind the players in the early 70s because they're like, look, these guys are getting paid to play a kid's game. We're going to work in a factory. I'm getting yelled at by my boss all these uh, days that I go to work. I'm miserable, and these guys have the nerve to strike. How was that in 1981? What was the sentiment there? It, it it was the same then, and it's the same now. You know, I'll I'll say this: uh, uh, fans are stupid. Fans don't see any clarity, right? So, I mean, I could go through a laundry list of things that I think are insane, right? The fan who says players are greedy, I'm on the owner's side, as if the owners are not greedy or less greedy. Another fan thing I love is. How could player X sign with another team for an extra fifty million? Doesn't he care? These fans would uproot their family and move across country for a ten thousand dollar raise. So don't tell me that someone's supposed to give up fifty million bucks. Um, the the absurd way fans look at things as if. Players need to be loyal to teams when teams are never loyal to players, ever, ever. Loyalty is a one-way street. Uh, fans are never on the player's side for the reasons you state. You know, players play a game. Uh, it's even, I think, more tricky in baseball because people don't look at the NBA and look at LeBron and say, you know what, given a break or two, I could have been LeBron James. But people look at every baseball player on the field who misses a pop-up, and they know in their heart, even though they're wrong, <laughs> I could have made that catch. I could have gotten a hit there. They look at ball players. I mean, you look at Altuve, right? And he's not Shaq, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, I could be. You know, when I was in high school, I was as good as Altuve. I just needed a break here or there. And it's so false. You know, that baseball is somehow, you know, the game that everyone would have excelled at. The game on the field is so much faster and so much higher level than what almost any person has played. And But it does make them resent baseball salaries in a way I don't think they resent, uh, like, basketball salaries. You don't really hear people talk about, I have no idea what LeBron makes. I do have an idea what, you know, Rich Hill makes, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's really interesting how people perceive uh, baseball salaries. And and another thing that fans and and writers too, to a degree, there's this weird belief that if it wasn't for Marvin Miller, tickets would still be fifty cents in the grandstand, and I could get a hot dog for a dime, as if as if baseball without Marvin Miller would have would have never incurred the price changes that we experience in every part of our life over time. Um, it's a weird kind of ignorant fantasy that fans have that in the old days, you know, or we could go back to the old days if it wasn't for Marvin Miller and the union. And it's, it's just not true. And, you know, some people are, people are like, you know, weirded about that because inflation does happen like you just mentioned and you know when you go to a ballpark now if you go to Fenway Park where I am and or if you go to Shea Stadium, not Shea Stadium, City Field I'm still living my New York when I lived in New York <laughs> you know I mean I moved out in 93 I came up here and my family's still back so but if you go there you're spending $300 not only on tickets but food uh, you know if your friends want beer and all this so it's basically a, a paycheck for a lot of folks so right. basically what I do is I go to the minor league teams, and Pawtucket is right 10 minutes away right. from me. You know, I'll pay a ticket for $10 and get a great seat and, you know, get a right. hamburger for a buck or, you know, whatever for a buck. Right. And I'll see the scoreboard, and I'll say, all right, well, the Red Sox and the Yankees are winning tonight. You know, well, that's good. Um, you know, have we gone too far, um, you know? And do, do, do you think the fans are losing out? Uh, 
because of these higher salaries and because of the owners trying to make back what they're literally giving out in expenses. Uh, again, I, like, I mean, that's like a romantic notion that somehow the owners are just raising prices just to make ends meet. The owners are making so much money in baseball. It doesn't. Salaries are less a percentage of revenue now than they were 30 years ago. So, you know, if the owners cared about, I, I mean, like this idea that salaries are so high that ticket prices have to be what they are now. It's just not true. It's just not true. <laughs> and owners care less about the fans than players do. <laughs> Look at what happened. I, I look what happened two years ago in Baltimore, right? <laughs> it was, you know, when there were the riots in Baltimore, there was no reason to close the Orioles Park to the public. There was none. But it didn't matter. The fans in the seats didn't matter to the bottom line. <laughs> they played a game in front of zero people, right? What is more, what is more indicative of how little the fan matters <laughs> than doing that? So – Ownership revenue, ownership profits are the highest they've ever been. These are profits. These are not break-even operations. It's not true. And the reality is that ticket prices are, are the, the least important thing compared to online revenue, TV revenue, merchandising, the, the fans and the seats are a different thing. Now, I will say that, you know, I don't know anyone in my life who's ever gone and, like, bought a ticket to see, like, an NBA game or an NFL game. They tend to get them from people who have season tickets, corporations. Baseball has always been the sport where people just buy tickets and go. I mean, maybe my experience is different. But the idea that you could get, you know, a great ticket at an NFL game at the 50-yard line and it be less than a baseball ticket, I don't believe that's true. <laughs> so I, I don't have any sympathy for owners. And, and there's one thing to have always in mind. Owners offer contracts. Owners are not forced to pay anyone anything. <laughs> So when ownership offers a guy $20 million and the guy takes it, it's not the guy's fault. If the owner can't afford that $20 million, well, that's on him. No one is forcing an owner to make that offer. And the fact is salaries are, as I mentioned, less a share of total baseball revenue now than they have been for decades. So the owners, again, you know, when you say, like, they're just raising these ticket prices to kind of cover their costs, that's not true. That's not well, true. They could lower no, ticket prices by 30% and make a profit. Yeah, and, the, the I, you know, what I meant to say is, you know, their expenses, the profits are like whatever, a 1,000%, you know, not only on food, but, uh, the, you know, uh, radio deals, serious deals, uh, television deals, you know, the whole marketing. I mean, they have the money. There's no question. But, you know, yeah. you talk to the owners, oh, why? oh i got to pay this, that, and that. But you still got all this money in the background. Yeah, so you, you know, yeah. Well, but owners, owners have always said that, like you said about the Yogi story, right? Yeah. Did the Yankees need to cut Yogi by $3,000 to make end meet? No, it was a way to kind of screw him over and show yeah. who's boss and play. You know, owners have, have complained about player salaries. You can look at articles from the 1880s and talk about how these guys are going to bankrupt my team. Yeah. <laughs> They're making 3000 a year now. It's not well, nice, it is, and you know, and you know what? And I'm going to end the inquiry here because we're going to have you back on the show because I knew this would go an hour, and the next time we have you on the show <laughs> probably will be. Well, you know, last time I had you on the show here, it was about two hours. I'm not going to do that to you because what I want to do is the next time I have you on my show, Jeff, uh, is to begin the inquiry on 
you know, what was the repercussions of the strike, you know, the whole format. And we'll get right. Into, well, uh, we'll get into the Yankees, we'll get into the Expos, we'll get into Pete Rose and, and Stan Musial and whatnot. Okay. That. You know, we'll get all that. Um, I spoke to you before the show. You are working on a, on a proposal now for baseball movies, and a lot of people don't know a lot about it. And, you know, prior to the Yankees, probably, you know, the biggest one, but, the Jackie Robinson story in 1950. Uh, one of my favorite was with Mr. Psycho himself. You know, in, uh, <laughs> Anthony Perkins, and that was done before yeah, Psycho. Right. You know, Fear yeah, Strikes yeah. Out is a great, yeah. I remember. You know, Bang the Drum Slowly with Robert De Niro was a great right. um, film. Damn Yankees. Even the Bad News Bears, which if oh, it yeah. was released today... Would never have made. They never would have made the sense. You see the right. kids drinking and smoking. Um, yeah, right. You know, I, you know, <laughs> I, and, and, you know. Hey, even and you know, some everyone saw Magnum PI in the eighties. If you were around, in the, I know you and right. I were around in the eighties. You know, he. I just did a show on Detroit the other day about the Alan Trammell and Trammell and Whitaker were on the show for one episode when he visited. <laughs> yeah. So, like, That's awesome. And then again, he played in the movie Mr. Baseball in 1992. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, and, and, and one of the one of the lesser known films which I loved as a kid, and I had HBO, uh, Blue Skies again about a, a girl with uh, baseball. A very, very. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, so you know, I wish you well with that. I mean, a league of their own is celebrating their 25th anniversary. All the girls at the right. and at the. Um, International Women's Baseball, um, um, you know, center. I, I had the good fortune of meeting them this year. Um, I met, oh, nice. Yeah, I met uh, them. I, they always support my sites. But you got you got a lot of research to do here for another great uh, uh, book here. Um, hey, I just want to know if you enjoyed being on the show today. Yeah, it's always fun talking to you. You know, uh, I Split season, you can tell, was a, a real passion project for me. It was a story I really wanted to tell and tell well and, and flesh out. And uh, I'm always grateful for the opportunity to talk about it and to talk about it with you. And you know something? I appreciate it. And you could see my inquiries were a little bit more educational than the first time that you were on this show because I've done that. No, it was great. It was a great conversation. You know, I've done my homework, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk to all these people and all the authors I learn from. And plus, like my folks uh, who listen to my show, I'm writing a, a manuscript. I'm going to be sending it out to people to read it and, and give their critiques. And all these people, all these uh, these contractors, these publishers, they want you to get, well, name five people who we could send to and get an honest opinion. <laughs> you might be on that list, you know. You know, you you might be on that list. Hold the line. This is how I end the show. Folks, this is one of my favorite books um, from 2015, uh, probably within the last few years. I mean, I loved loved the split season of 81. I remember being uh, disappointed, 11-year-old. I had just turned 11 that May. The strike began at the end of June. I do remember that whole summer, the whole first of Brooklyn Day Camp out in Rockaway, just no baseball, and it, was, and it was just, we were all talking about it, you know, the Yankees and Billy Martin and Oakland, and I, and I remember that. I remember the disappointment I felt when the Yankees lost to the Dodgers. It's a very important season. This is a very good book. The holidays are coming up quickly. Why don't you do yourself a favor, go out, get this book. It's really enjoyable reading. Jeff is a fantastic writer. It is full of talk. Uh, full of stuff. You'll see George blowing a gasket in New York, as Steinbrenner was always known. You get to see this whole, you know, this whole drama play out between Marvin Miller, Graby, and the whole strike. It, it's a fascinating, a very fascinating season. Montreal, Rick Monday on the Dodges. I mean, it's 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 history that unfortunately today seems primitive but it makes for a great story because when you look at it, some people will say 68 began the modern age of baseball because 69, you had the the breakup divisions. But I think, like Jeff said, it saved baseball, the 81 strike. It's a pivotal year in baseball history. Go out, get it, split season 1981. You can go get it on Amazon. Uh, uh, Let me ask you, Jeff, does uh, uh, St. Martin's Press still have it? Uh, You know, I don't know. 
I assume yeah. they do. <laughs> hey, you're, hey, you're the guy that gets the quarterly check from this, you know? So yeah, it's right, like, the, right. <laughs> you know, you're the guy that gets the quarterly check or whatever your contract. Hold the line. Folks, go get this book. As always, I'm Ian Kahanowitz. I'm in for the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. It was an honor to have Jeff Katz, mayor of Cooperstown. And remember, he doesn't have any connections there. He just, you know, live, resides nearby. So if you're going to think you're going to listen to the show and say, hey, I nominate this, he's the wrong Jeff to send. I think I got to send it to Jeff Heidelson up in the, in the hall. So, um, folks, as always, in the, in the immortal words of Edward Al Morrow, good night, good luck. We'll see you next time, folks.